healthcare is actually in a pretty bad place today because we rely on expert opinion instead of real science. And so if you take a, a subject like cardiology, there was a famous study I covered where the same data was given to 40 cardiologists asking if the patient should do cardiac surgery or not, half said yes, and the other half said no on any given patient record using the same data. That, if you think that's not bad enough, uh, they turned around and gave the same data to the same cardiologist two years later and 40% had changed their mind on their recommendation. So it's completely random. Uh, <laughs> I like to say diagnostic error today is roughly the same as if Google was allowed to have a driverless car that had one accident a week uh, only. Um, it's about 10 to 20 percent uh, is the diagnostic error rate. If we get data, it'll get much worse. Um, you know, every blood sample shouldn't be 30 blood tests or biomarkers that you see. It could be 300,000. Humans can't comprehend that. Uh, a psychiatric evaluation isn't a one-hour conversation where you're talking about self-reporting how the patient's feeling. It's thousands of data points a day, every day, uh, that actually uh, Ginger I.O. is doing, that's actually predictive of behavior, uh, and you can quantify it uh, and test it. Uh, so that kind of stuff, when you're starting to see orders of magnitude more data, uh, humans will be much worse at developing insights from it than we can today, and systems have to do that. Just because we don't know what will happen doesn't mean something won't happen. Uh, uh, I think people miss the two. I like to say I'll probably be wrong on the specifics of what I forecast, but I'll be directionally right. Um, and I think that's where the opportunity lies. If we're too certain about what the solution is, we are more likely to be wrong than right. Um, if we take the view that we'll be agile and iterative and arrive at the right answer, um, then in fact we'll be able to follow along, especially for entrepreneurs. Uh, the analogy I like to use is the first phone I have, what I call my V0 mobile phone, was like a sewing machine. It was actually mounted on the floorboard of my car. Uh, and its handset cord was much, much bigger than today's cell phones. Um, and if you trace seven generations from there, you get to the iPhone today. Uh, and you have to think in these, and there's been a new generation every two to four years or so. And if you look at the change between that, that phone from 1986 and today, it's stunningly large, and I'll, I think healthcare transformation will look the same. We talk too much about ACA and the U.S. healthcare system. The U.S. population is a small single-digit percentage of the global population, so we should keep that in mind. My view is very simple. If you're not willing to fail, you're not doing anything new. Because doing something new means you're taking a risk. There's no such thing as risk without failure. So uh, there is no such thing as courage if you're not scared. Right? Um, I forget who had a great saying on courage only exists if you're actually scared, if you're afraid. So doing something new necessarily involves the risk of failure. If you, and you, I'd rather, I like to say, try and fail than fail to try. And I find too many people fail to try and entrepreneurs will try and sometimes they fail and sometimes they succeed. Um, a related issue which I especially tell entrepreneurs is sometimes people want to reduce risk to the point where they increase the probability of success but they make the consequences of success inconsequential. Think about it. You can always reduce risk to the point of if you succeed, you, uh, your probability of succeeding goes up, but you're not going to make any difference. Um, and it's a fine balance between the probability of failure and the probability of a large consequence of what you do. And um, you know, many entrepreneurs ask me about this. Uh, generally, you do better financially and otherwise 
if you focus on the mission than on making money. Uh, because when you cause large change, impact the system in some significant way, you're likely to do the financial part as a side effect of doing something large. Probably the thing that entrepreneurs miss the most is after you have the facts on your side, it's not good enough. You have to do storytelling. Right? Most people, especially the press, like stories. So you have to frame what you're doing in the right context so it's, there's an emotional connection to your story, somebody you help, a niche you help, a place where you solve the large problem that would otherwise have been catastrophic. Those are the things that make it uh, memorable. Um, and so startups uh, have not only to be good at the science, they have to be good at communications and getting their message across. I actually believe digital health in general will be much faster innovation cycles than I'll call it biological health. Uh, I think if you're introducing a new drug into the body, it's hard to say you shouldn't go through all the safety checks before you apply it to a billion or seven billion people. Uh, and so I don't know if the pharma cycle will be accelerated. Some of it probably can with digital techniques, uh, but not a whole lot. Uh, I do believe the cycle for Selective introduction of digital technologies will be two to three years. I do believe the cycles will be short. Already, if you look at CellScope or LiveCore or Ginger.io, their innovation cycles are more like a year than 10 years. And so I'm optimistic digital health in general will move much faster. It's really hard to predict the exact direction the future will take. Uh, we shouldn't try and be precise. I think we should optimize for iteration and flexibility. Uh, I'm fairly convinced that between all the devices that are generating data, the so-called quantitative self stuff, uh, mobile phone applications like the Ginger IO, psychiatry application, things like the Jawbone band, uh, tracking your blood pressure, your heart rate, heart rate variability, we will discover new insights. Uh, so one of the examples I covered in my talk was uh, th there's some very messy physiologic data that's used all the time, uh, in, uh, that is collected all the time in neonatal uh, units. Uh, Without machine learning, that data is not very decipherable. You're looking at one trace at a time, but you look 20, look across correlations, you can do much better than the APGAR score that any, um, uh, any doctor will tell you is uh, the best we have today in uh, predicting morbidity in, in newborn children. To predict what we will discover, is, uh, it's too early and I think would be too limiting. In fact, I'm almost certain that most of what we will discover about medicine are questions today we don't even know to ask. Questions we ask today are based on measurements we could do, whether it's the 30 biomarkers that are common in the blood test or it's the heart rate. So the most interesting discoveries the next 15 years will be questions we did not know to ask. Almost certainly diabetes isn't one disease, it's a dozen diseases. But we don't know that, we just measure it by one symptom, which is poor blood sugar control. In fact, Denny Arciello, who's at MGH, says that it's at least a dozen different diseases. How you approach the FDA matters a lot. In the live court case, they used no FDA consultants, okay? They decided that if they went in and had pre-meetings with the FDA, uh, you, they would get a set of requirements they have to meet based on historical uses of such EKGs or ECGs. Right? Instead of doing that, what they said, how can we make a compelling case why this device can save lives and not cause harm, which the FDA worries about. Mm -hmm. And they did that 
without a lot of pre-meetings and without any FDA consultants, and made a logical argument. The people at the FDA are logical people, smart people. They're trying to do a difficult job between approving new things for patients and public safety. Um, and in that case, it worked. Um, so again, my only advice to you is you have to listen to the people who tell you what the problems are, but you shouldn't take their solutions. Good entrepreneurs find their own solutions, but they don't ignore the problems. If you're not getting funding, you should read it as a sign that there's some really hard thing you're trying to do. Now, that doesn't mean you give up. But I always say, even if you're not looking for funding, you should go talk to a bunch of people, venture capitalists, because they're putting their money at risk. They'll critique the plan. So there's nothing better you can do for a startup, even if you don't need money, than to find all the risks. By talking to VCs, you can define all the risks. The role of the physician is not defined today. Uh, what it will become, I couldn't predict. But most likely, it's got to do things with empathy and others. Now, Atul Gawande wrote a great piece on how in, I think it was in the New Yorker, on how systems can be much more holistic in their approach. But that doesn't mean humans don't have to play a role. Now, my best guess is you won't select MD uh, students to medical school the same way. You won't select them on IQ. You may select them on mirror neurons, people with more empathy. Um, I sometimes jokingly say, maybe you'll go to UCLA film school uh, to get the best doctors. Uh, I don't know. Uh, all I'm saying is when the role changes, uh, it will be something different. So thank you all very much.